So, hello everybody and welcome back. Hello, Dan. How it's been so long, about 10 minutes or so. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, or less. For them, it may be like a week or two. Yes, it might. Yeah. That's right. But we're doing these in quick succession. And as promised, after last week's video, uh, where we were discussing kind of how you discuss Jesus with people. Initially, and, the first contact. Yeah, and some of those first contact, first opportunity sort of things. Um, we said that the other question that came in was from someone who works a lot with young people, late teens, early 20s, you know, that sort of age group. And... <clears throat> He was struggling to find any discussions about, all right, I have this person who has come to me, and they're struggling with God and the concept of God because he seems so mean, like his judgment and the times when he would wipe people out and all these other things. And when you go looking for things, there's a lot of apologetic videos out there. So like they're trying to talk about the cosmological arguments for God's judgment, and they're trying to explain all these big, deep concepts, mm -hmm. which are very useful. And if that's your thing and you're needing that, absolutely go looking for There's a lot of great resources out there. But we're going to take a little bit more of the conversational approach. Mm -hmm. Like what are some things in the Bible that we would point to? What are just some points of contact we might make personally with them? Um, because, and, and this is kind of my own personal feelings about a lot of things, we spend a lot of time talking in the negative from the Bible, you know, things that you shouldn't do or bad things that happen and all this other stuff, whereas the whole draw of God and his word, to me personally at least, is how much good is in it. Like, like how much God loves us and how much he wants to bless us. And yeah, thing. and how much <clears throat> he's cared for us, how much he has cared for unexpected people in unexpected ways. And so this I, is good and acceptable in the sight of God, our Savior, who would have all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. Mm, mm -hmm. God is not willing that any should perish, but yeah. that all should come to repentance. Now, that's the God of the New Testament, though, Dan. So sure is. Isn't the God of the Old Testament mean and angry? Mm, and No, he's I, good. And see, I think this is where. But he, he can get angry. Yes, in a righteous judgment situation. Absolutely. And for a really good reason when you read those stories. But that know? doesn't mean he's mean or bad. Yeah. And so I think that's kind of the first thing, for me at least, um, when I'm talking to, like if I'm reading the Bible with my children, who are right now, my two oldest are kind of the 9 to 11 range. So Mine are in like the 45 to 50 range. <laughs> so if I'm talking to... This younger age, or if I'm teaching their Bible class or something, so these are a little younger than than what the questioner was looking at. A lot of times, I try to show them what was behind God's judgment. Like, why did He judge them? It wasn't out of the blue. That it's like when you. Um, but I think culturally, you you help me if I'm wrong here. Yeah. With our culture and our postmodern thinking, <clears throat> the why of God's judgment may not cut very much ice with a lot of people yeah, today. In some cases, it probably won't. And that is more of an apologetic answer. It, it's kind it's of a yes. biblical answer. Yes. I'm just saying if, you know. Yeah, I think the, the biggest difference in kind of the apologetic approach versus the reasonable, like, hey, let's just look at the story, is so many people view God's judgment as more like a Zeus or a Thor or an Odin that it just lightning often, bolt to you. Yeah, it often comes out of nowhere. Arbitrary. Yeah. Well, for example, they're angry. Let, they're, let's take Israel, as you mentioned in our pre-conversation. Yeah, Hosea eleven is a great passage. Turn okay. to Hosea eleven because I think okay. this will illustrate what you're trying to say yeah. as you explain this. God's thinking about Israel even though at times God punished them severely. Hosea yeah. 11, starting with verse 1, and just read okay. little ways. All right. When Israel was a child, I loved him. And out of Egypt, I called my son. The more they were called, the more they went away. They kept sacrificing to the Baals and burning offerings to the idols. Yet it was I who taught Ephraim to walk. I took them up by their arms, but they did not know that I healed them. I led them with cords of kindness, bands of love, and I became to them as one who eases the yoke on their jaw. I bent down to them. I fed them. They shall not return to the land of Egypt, but Assyria shall be their king because they refused to return to me. Okay, now see, God loves Israel like, like we love a little child. Mm, yeah. <clears throat> and he held them and he led them. And he taught them to walk, and taught them to walk, and he bent down to them, mm -hmm. and he showered them with kindness, and he did everything he knew how to do yeah. to love them, and then they just persisted 
in rebelling and doing the things that he didn't yeah. want them to do. And finally, he sent the king of Assyria, this is talking about the northern kingdom, Israel, yeah. to take them away into captivity. Yeah. Now, and this does that is, mean he was mean? And this is the northern kingdom that has almost from, like, very shortly after the United Kingdom happened, they split off. Jeroboam and his uh, great sins. And he went and established two golden calf idols in two places of worship that weren't what God had called and them. And yet they God had, sent prophets to them and oh, begged yeah. them and said, I love you and I want you For to come. For hundreds of years yes, he so, held out. So to think God was mean by doing that is yeah. not to read the story, like right. you said. Right. Okay, so that's a really good example from Scripture about God's love. Uh, here's another one. Okay. In Luke 19. Okay. <clears throat> um, we always we sing a, a real cute little song about him. <laughs> yes. Because, you know, he climbed up in the sycamore tree, the Savior for to see. But, but Zacchaeus was yeah. a jerk. <laughs> and let's read Luke 19 starting in verse 1. Okay. So he, I assume this is Jesus, he entered Jericho. And was passing through, and there was a man named Zacchaeus. He was a chief tax collector, so not even just a regular old one, a chief one, and he was rich, and he was seeking to see Jesus. Now, let's stop right there. The tax collectors were hated by the Jews mm -hmm. because they worked for the Romans, yep. and they exploited their own people by stealing from them over and above the Roman mm -hmm. taxation yeah. and making themselves rich off of the suffering of the Jewish people. Of their own people. Yes, this was Zacchaeus. Yeah. Everybody don't think Zacchaeus was so sweet and nice. And he was, no, man, he was a jerk. He was a bad guy. You could almost say he was a white-collar criminal. You, you couldn't just almost say it. You could just <laughs> flat out say he, it. He was, with, <clears throat> with kind of... Permission from the Roman government, sort of thing. Yeah, like they knew this sort but of thing. But the Roman covenant, that, the Roman government was the foreign <laughs> army that had just devastated Judea. Yeah, and were occupying their country. They just wanted their tax money. And Zacchaeus was working for the foreign yeah. army. Okay, so that's Zacchaeus. All right, keep going. He's seeking to see who Jesus was. Here, verse three. But on account of the crowd, he could not because he was so small of stature. Now, do you think there was probably a little bit of him trying to get forward, and they're like, now ah, we know you, get back. Like, it could have been, we, yeah. let him through. But he could climb that tree. He could. So, verse 4, he ran on ahead, climbed up into a sycamore tree to see Jesus, for he was about to pass that way. And when Jesus came to the place, he looked up and saw, said to him, Zacchaeus, hurry and come down, for I must stay at your house today. So, if, if this young person, whoever it is, is struggling with the judgment of God. Mm -hmm. Here's God in the flesh, Jesus. Mm -hmm. And he knows the mm -hmm. bad character and everything of Zacchaeus and has every reason to be angry with Zacchaeus. Yeah. But still, yeah. he is the God that doesn't want anybody to perish but wants all to come to repentance. Yeah. Then he loves that sorry little rascal that's up there. <laughs> and he says, Zacchaeus... Get down here. I want to go home with you today. I want to spend some time with you mm. and see if you're going to hold on to your evil ways. Right? Yeah. Yeah. And I, I love that idea. <clears throat> and that's it, it's so condensed. And like you say, we teach it to little kids and everything. In a similar way, we teach a story to little kids about what happened for a, an entire city, a massive major city, when we talk about Jonah and the whale or the big fish. you know. And we go, okay, that's a cute story. He gets swallowed by the fish and then he spit out again. But if you go back and like read historical accounts of what Nineveh was doing and what their culture was like, it was a terrible place. Yeah, but know. God loved them and sent Jonah because he loved them. And, and then when they repented, that made Jonah angry. And like, Jonah was more worried about the gourd plant that was his shade than he yeah. was about 120,000 people. So this idea that God's love was so great that it would even make the people who already follow God angry to see such amazing love on display. Yeah. Like, I think that's the part that we don't always put together is, yes, there are times of judgment because of how bad things are. But Big that's time. also after plenty of opportunities for repentance, for coming to God, all these different things. And in some cases, like in the case of Jonah, direct messages from him saying, hey, this could come your way. And in their case, they chose to turn away for a good long period of time. Right. So, well, and, and the Bible teaches that God is patient. Yeah. 
he's long suffering. So he doesn't strike at yeah. the first. He, he's he's patient with people as long as he can be, and then he judges them because of his own righteous judgment. But it's not until he's been loving and kind and patient mm. with them. Yeah, and again, for depending on the the position someone is in their life, none of this may hold water with them. They may still be like, yeah, but. And then they'll give whatever that particular example well, is. Well, and that would be, you know, am I willing to, I want to back up. I'm thinking that some people who feel this way, mm. they feel this, how could God be so mean way? Because they really haven't read the story. In if they time, would so. really read the story, mm. they would see the love of God. They would see the patience of God. They would see the care of God for Israel. They would see how far God went yeah. before God judged. And they would realize that he is not that mean, knee-jerk, I want to kill you all type of Not at all. In fact, even in his judgment, mm -hmm. he's hoping that the judgment will bring some people to, back to him. Yeah. I. I think of one example that I think we would be remiss if we don't mention because it will get brought up, you know, when we're talking about, oh, he doesn't strike people dead and all these different things. He I, does at times. At times. And so one of those big stories is in Acts when you have people that the church was growing and everyone's coming to, you know, the following of Jesus and they're giving up their things and they're selling things because they want the movement to continue and they want to take care of these young Christians, the new body that's <clears throat> coming about and people are from all over coming in. And then this one couple, Ananias and Sapphira, they decide to sell their land like some others had done, but they want to aggrandize themselves, and so they don't accurately report exactly what's going on. They and, lie. And in that moment, Ananias is struck dead. And then Sapphira comes in a little bit later like, hey, where's my husband or whatever? And they say, hey, what's the situation? And she repeats the same lies, and she is struck dead. But the end of that story was great fear came upon all of everyone else, and they continued and moved on. So there was a lesson in that, and there was opportunity again for, hey, are you sure this is the truth? And they chose to stick with their lie. So again, it seems really harsh and immediate, but it's still not out of the greater context of the other things we've talked about. That's right. That's right. And, and fear... The right kind of fear for God is part of understanding God, mm -hmm. but but the more you seek to have a relationship with God, the more that fear diminishes in the sense that you know that God loves you and you know that God is on your side. Um, you know, if God is for us, who can be against us? He that uh, spared not his own son, but freely delivered him up for us all, shall he not also with him freely give us all things, mm -hmm. you know? I mean, I was just talking about this with, with one of our kids' Bible classes last night, and I wanted to make sure uh, for 9, yeah, there we go. Uh, Proverbs 9.10 was the verse we were going through with them, where the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. Mm -hmm. And for the kids, we were talking about if you were climbing a mountain, like number one, and you came to a cliff ledge, and you fear the edge of the cliff, but that doesn't mean you just sit down and you never move again. Yeah. You go, okay, I understand what could happen if I get too close to the ledge. And so you move a little closer to the mountain. You just avoid the ledge. Yeah. And you go, okay, I respect what could happen here, but I'm going to use what I understand and what I know and what I appreciate and continue moving forward. Mm -hmm. Whereas the same thing here is the fear of the Lord doesn't put you in like petrification to where you can't move and you hate things and you whatever but it's an understanding of the power that exists, and then you move forward with appreciation for what's around you. And there's all, God is, is the father of the prodigal son who no matter what you've done, mm -hmm. God is always there with open arms when you're penitent and you turn to him. Yeah. And that's throughout Scripture. It's mm -hmm. always been the case. Yeah. Uh, so it's not that we apologize for the righteous judgment of God. It is that... When you read the story, yeah, you read the story of a patient, loving mm -hmm. God who has done everything to plan the redemption of man and still has his arms always out open to us, and yet some people continue to rebel. There's, there's two scriptures mm -hmm. that I'd like to look at 
Okay. Maybe, depending, you can cut one I, of these out if you I need to. I think we're good, yeah. But in Isaiah 5, let's turn to Isaiah 5. Okay. This is the story of the vineyard, the song of the vineyard. I'm thinking okay. it starts with the first verse there. I will sing to my beloved. Uh, yeah. So let me sing for my beloved, my love song concerning his vineyard. My beloved had a vineyard on a very fertile hill. He dug it, cleared it of stones, and planted it with choice vines. He built a watchtower in the midst of it and hewed out a wine vat in it. And he looked for its yield of grapes, but it yielded wild grapes. And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and men of Judah, judge between me and my vineyard. What more was there to do for my vineyard than I have not done for it? When I looked for it to yield grapes, why did it yield wild grapes? Now I will tell you. What I will do to my vineyard, I will remove its hedge, and it shall be devoured. I will break down its wall, and it shall be trampled down. It shall be made a waste. It shall not be pruned or hoed. Its briars and thorns will grow up, and I will command the clouds that they will not rain upon it. For the vineyard of the Lord of hosts is the house of Israel. The men of Judah are pleasing are, and his pleasant planting. And he looked for justice, but behold, bloodshed. For righteousness, but behold, an outcry. There you go. That's a great story. It is. It's a really beautiful poem there. And, and it really illustrates all the care that mm. God put into his vineyard and all the work and all the love and all the everything. Yeah. And then expecting the good fruit of yeah. righteousness, he got the opposite. And so, okay. Yeah. He set everything <clears throat> up for success, and yet somehow they chose failure. Yep. And then one more. Okay. Isaiah 63. Okay. Okay. 7 through 10. Okay, 63, 7 through 10. This is a lot like the Hosea passage, but mm. to those of you that are talking to your young people or have these same feelings yourself, this is God. Yeah, this is God revealing himself directly. Right. Yeah, here we go. Isaiah 63, starting in verse 7. I will recount the steadfast love of the Lord, the praises of the Lord. According to all that the Lord has granted me and the great goodness to the house of Israel that he has granted to them according to his compassion, according to the abundance of his steadfast love. For he said, Surely they are my people, children, who will not deal falsely. And he became their Savior. In all their afflictions he was afflicted, and the angel of his presence saved them. In his love and in his pity he redeemed them and lifted them up and carried them all the days of old. But they rebelled and they grieved his Holy Spirit. Therefore he turned to be their enemy and himself fought against them. Then he remembered the days of old of Moses and his people. Where is he who brought them up out of the sea with shepherds of his flock? Where is he who put in the midst of them his Holy Spirit, who caused his glorious arm to go at the right hand of Moses, who divided the waters before them to make himself an everlasting name, who led them through the depths? All right, so this story that you're reading... Really, if you think of Isaiah in 700 A.D., mm -hmm. and you think back 700 years earlier to Moses, yeah. and the whole story of the history of Israel in between is in that little mm -hmm. poetic prophecy right there. Yeah. And so it's all these years of God's deliverance and how he got them out of Egypt and how he gave them a land and how he set them up and how he, you know, he did everything he could possibly do for them all these years, and then they... They just persisted in rebellion against him, and then he became their enemy. And then they yeah. wondered, well, where is God that's always been taking care of us? Well, you've you've chosen to yeah. rebel, and that's why this is happening to you. That's yeah. the story. Yeah, and in, in, a, in the truth of it, and what he's saying is, I've been there with them the whole way. Right. I've been watching them. I've been providing for them. So he's not mean and bad. He's he's patient and loving and kindness. And how many times does his loving kindness and compassion yeah. occur in that? So we give God a bad rap, but God is a God of justice, but he is a God of love and mercy and compassion. And he always opens the door for people to come back to him, yeah. even if they stray away from him. Yeah. And I think that's just the interesting thing about, like say, when you're talking with different people, because for some people, they need to know that justice exists because of bad things in their Everybody life. Everybody does. And then for some people, the idea that justice exists in whatever form is frustrating to them. And so having... But having that is a problem 
in their conception of the world and their thinking. Yeah, and that's, I was going to say, so we should have compassion for whatever the situation may be so that we can properly, you know, find the stories, find the things that connect with them and help show them the truth of who God is. Yeah. Did you know that in in the story of the temptation of Jesus, mm-hmm. yeah. you know, when he quotes, Jesus uh, uh, keeps quoting Deuteronomy to the devil. Mm-hmm. And when when Jesus says, it is written, you shall worship the Lord of Lord your God, and him only do you serve shall you serve. Yeah. Well, that scripture in Deuteronomy in the Hebrew mm-hmm. says, and the word worship is actually the word yire, which means to fear. Mm-hmm. So literally in Hebrew it says, You shall fear the Lord your God and him yeah. only. Yeah. Shall you serve? So even though God is love and we we should the closer we get to God, the less we have to fear. The very word for worship there is the word for fear. So a little bit of fear of the Lord is not bad as long as we know that he's a loving God and he's on our side and he wants us to succeed. Right. It's that element of you you should fear because you understand his power, but not fear to the point of literally being afraid. Unless you are in rebellion. There you go. Then you might ought to be a little bit afraid. Yeah. Okay. So... (laughs) So again, it, there's like so many conversational type questions, it will depend on the person, your relationship to them, their particular uh, life and what Where they what are at the through. moment. Yeah. Yeah. But hopefully some of this will help give you an idea, a couple of passages to look at, maybe for you personally, for you to explore. And it is that rather than having the character of God be what is in your mind or in the minds of others, really try to explore the full character of God. And yeah, read the is. story, really, and see that we're being unfair to God if we make some of these judgments about it. Yeah. Okay. But he is who he is. Oh, yeah. And like you said, we don't apologize for who God is, like right. in the sense of like, oh, I'm sorry, God did this in that situation. And I think sometimes preachers have a tendency to almost do that, and mm-hmm. I I don't think that's a good thing to do. Uh, what You saddled me with some scripture. You were out of town, and you had me teach your class once, and it was one of those passages where it's like, I don't like that it says this, but I have to believe that there was a reason for it and trust in it. And I'm going to tell you. You say I saddled you with it, right? <laughs> you did. You left town and went, here you go. Yeah, maybe I was, didn't want to go through that and I wanted you to do it. Or yeah, something. but it was that sort of thing where, and I made a comment to probably my wife about this. I said, if I really believe it, if I really believe all of it, there should be no problem with me preaching or teaching on this passage rather than shying away from it. And so it actually was a good thing for me to go through it and kind of reaffirm some stuff. and Process it in your own mind. Yeah. Because otherwise good. it's easy to read those passages and go, ooh, I don't, want, I don't want to mess with that anymore. And Jed's a guy that if, you, if he sees it in the Bible and it says it, then he's going to accept it. That's all there is to it. Yeah. And he is kind of hard-headed in some areas, but <laughs> okay, never mind. <laughs> He's not wrong. So, you know, there we go. But we are glad to have you here. We hope that this has been a profitable conversation for you, maybe encouraging, give you some some other things to look into. And I don't know what we'll be doing next time, but we'll be back again soon. Yeah, and one parting shot. Okay. Listen to your young person and inquire a little bit further and say, tell me a little bit more about why this upsets you and what you're upset about and what your thoughts are when you think about this and Mm -hmm. let them in a very safe way come out and explain this and then some of the things we've talked about today might help but a lot of times if if they just come out with you know i just don't understand god's judgment and but there's probably a situation or a Mm -hmm. person or a friend or something that's behind that and that might even help the conversation so anyway yeah god bless y'all have a great day see y'all